early 2024, the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, a Houthi anti-ship ballistic missile, arcs in toward the destroyer USS Gravely, followed by waves of drones and cruise missiles. The crew has seconds to react. In at least one engagement, a hostile missile closed to within about a mile of the ship before Gravely's weapon stopped it. That kind of fight doesn't happen once. It happens over and over. Every intercept burns fuel. Every SM-2, SM-6, ESSM, and CRAM round fired has to be replaced. The carrier's air wing is guzzling thousands of gallons of jet fuel per day, just flying combat air patrols and strike missions. The destroyers are gulping marine diesel every hour they stay at battle stations. And none of that works without a ship almost no one outside the Navy has ever heard of. Dozens of miles away, a 750-foot gray hull is charging through contested waters at more than 25 knots. USNS Supply. She can pump fuel through 5-inch hoses at around 3,000 gallons per minute per station and sling pallets of missiles, bombs, food, and spare parts at the same time, while matching the course and speed of billion-dollar warships in a live combat zone. This isn't just logistics. This is what lets U.S. carrier strike groups fight continuously thousands of miles from home. Because here's what the Pentagon doesn't put on recruiting posters. The high-end forward-deployed U.S. fleet, its carriers and their escorts, depends on just two fast combat support ships, two aging hulls that provide a capability almost no one else on Earth can match. And right now, as tensions spike from the Red Sea to the Taiwan Strait, America is quietly drifting toward a logistics crisis that could cripple its naval power. Today, you're going to see why USNS Supply and USNS Arctic are the Navy's secret lifeline, and why that lifeline is fraying. Let me show you the problem. In October 2023, the Dwight D. Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group left Norfolk and eventually surged into the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden as part of Operation Prosperity Guardian and follow-on operations. The mission, protect commercial shipping, keep the Suez lifeline open, and hold the line against a sustained campaign of Houthi drone and missile attacks. On paper, the Ike Strike Group looks invincible, a nuclear-powered carrier that doesn't need to refuel for decades, guided missile destroyers bristling with interceptors, an air wing that can strike targets hundreds of miles away. But the physics haven't changed. The carrier's reactors don't power aircraft, the jets drink JP-5. The escorts burn marine diesel and aviation fuel. Keeping cap in the air and Aegis radars spinning around the clock turns a nuclear carrier group into a giant gas and ammo fire hose. That's where USNS supply comes in. From October 2023 through May 2024, the Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group executed some of the most sustained naval combat operations the U.S. has seen since World War II. Measured in sorties and weapons expended, not in ship losses. The air wing flew nearly 14,000 sorties, logging over 31,400 flight hours, and the ships fired hundreds of defensive and strike weapons. Behind that tempo is one ship. During that same window, USNS Supply spent 247 days at sea, steaming more than 50,000 nautical miles through some of the most dangerous waters on the planet. She conducted 143 underway replenishments, transferring over 87 million gallons of fuel and about 14,928 pallets of ammunition, food, and critical supplies to U.S. and Allied warships, all of it with a civilian mariner crew, plus a small military detachment. Very few ships in the world could have pulled that off. So who are these workhorses? The Navy calls them Fast Combat Support Ships, AOE 6 class. Four were built in the 1990s, Supply, Arctic, Rainier, and Bridge. They were designed to solve a problem that's haunted fleets since sail. How do you keep a battle group supplied, at speed, in blue water far from home? Here's the twist. In the mid-2010s, facing budget pressure, the Navy inactivated Rainier and Bridge and placed them in reserve. The decision was justified as saving roughly $30-plus million per year in operations and support, compared to keeping all four gas turbine AOEs online. On a spreadsheet, that looked like a win. In reality, it meant that by the time Ike was dodging missiles in the Red Sea, the most powerful Navy on Earth had just two fast combat support ships left in active service, USNS Supply in the Atlantic and USNS Arctic in the Pacific. Two ships, global commitments. You can probably see where this is going. To understand why this is dangerous, you need to know what these ships actually do. Most people picture slow cargo ships lumbering behind the fleet. That's wrong. 
Modern carrier strike groups cruise at 20 to 25 knots. Traditional replenishment ships, like the Lewis and Clark class dry cargo ships and Kaiser class oilers, top out around 20 knots and don't carry everything a strike group needs in one hull. Supply class AOEs are different. They're three ships in one, a fleet oiler, an ammunition ship, and a store ship combined. Each hull is about 754 feet long, powered by four LM2500 gas turbines, generating around 105,000 shaft horsepower and capable of roughly 26 knots, fast enough to keep up with a carrier. Cargo-wise, a single supply class can carry more than 177,000 barrels of fuel, over 7 million gallons of petroleum products, 2,150 tons of ammunition, 500 tons of dry stores, and 250 tons of refrigerated provisions. But capacity is only half the trick. These ships are built to do multi-product, high-speed replenishment, connected replenishment, CONREP, ships steaming side by side, often 30 to 50 yards apart, with fuel hoses and cargo rigs strung between them. Vertical replenishment, VERTREP, helicopters ferrying pallets of ordnance, mail, and food between decks. A supply class AOE can run multiple fueling stations and multiple cargo rigs at once, effectively supporting up to three combatants simultaneously while still moving at strike group speeds. Think of it as aerial refueling for ships, except you're doing it with tens of thousands of gallons of flammable fuel in heavy seas, with live ordnance swinging on lines between holes. Before ships like Supply and Arctic, the Navy leaned heavily on single product ships, separate ammo ships, oilers, and store ships. Each one needed escorts, each demanded its own rendezvous, and each introduced predictable patterns an enemy submarine or bomber could exploit. Fast combat support ships changed that calculus, built to near combatant standards with shock hardening and high speed. The AOE became the station ship for the carrier, the one big logistics node that keeps the strike route going, while smaller shuttle ships haul supplies forward from ports. Admiral Arleigh Burke wanted this kind of capability coming out of World War II, it took the supply class in the 1990s to fully realize it, but there was something the original design didn't account for. Success plus cost. AOEs are incredible, but they're expensive to operate thanks to those gas turbines and high speeds. That made them attractive targets for budget cutters who assumed slower, cheaper ships could do logistics well enough. The Red Sea proved that assumption wrong. Let's unpack what supply actually did for the Ike Strike Group because the numbers tell a story the Navy only hints at in press releases. From late 2023 through spring 2024, Eisenhower and her escorts were in near continuous operations, fighting off Houthi drones and missiles, striking launch sites and weapons depots, and responding to attacks on commercial shipping. The carrier air wing flew almost 14,000 sorties and logged over 31,400 flight hours, a tempo comparable to some of the heaviest carrier deployments of the post-Cold War era. Ships in the group fired scores of defensive missiles and hundreds of precision-guided weapons. All of that depends on fuel, ordnance, food, and spare parts arriving at exactly the right time. According to Military Sealift Command and follow-on reporting, during that same window, USNS Supply steamed more than 50,000 nautical miles, spent 247 days away from home port, conducted 143 underway replenishments, delivered over 87 million gallons of fuel, moved nearly 15,000 pallets of cargo, ammo, food, mail, repair parts, to U.S. and coalition ships. She didn't do that in a safe training area. She did it inside the threat envelope of anti-ship ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and drones. But that success exposed three ugly truths. One, two ships, Global Navy. While supply was tied to Eisenhower in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, USNS Arctic was the only fast combat support ship available to support carrier operations in the Pacific and elsewhere. If a major crisis had erupted around Taiwan during those months, the Navy would have faced a brutal trade-off, strip supply out of CENTCOM and accept risk in the Red Sea, or leave only slower, single-product ships to support carriers in the Indo-Pacific. The Navy's own force structure analyses and outside studies underline this. In high-end conflict, a carrier strike group is expected to have either one AOE or a pair of ships AO plus T8 to do what a single fast combat support ship can accomplish. Right now, there are only two AOEs left. Two, mechanical and human strain. Supplies deployment tempo compressed what many logistics ships might do in two years into seven months of hard steaming. That's brutal on 
fuel pumps, and transfer rigs constantly cycling at high load. Gas turbines running sustained high-speed legs. Winches, wires, and elevators used for near-daily conreps and vertreps. When she finally returned to Norfolk in July 2024, the ship needed significant maintenance, pulling her out of the line and leaving Arctic as the only operational AOE for a period while MSC worked through repairs and a broader civilian mariner shortage. And that brings us to the people. AOEs are crewed primarily by civilian mariners, CIVMARS, under military sea lift command, plus a small Navy debt. These are not conscripted. They volunteer to spend hundreds of days at sea in what very quickly turned into an active combat zone. Meanwhile, MSC as a whole is struggling to recruit and retain enough mariners. In 2024, the Navy approved a plan to sideline up to 17 logistic ships, including oilers, expeditionary fast transports, and sea bases, just to reduce stress on its limited CIVMAR workforce and get manning up toward 95%. The takeaway, when you only have two AOEs and you're short of mariners, every long high-stress deployment like supplies has cascading effects across the logistics fleet. Three, recognition without replacement. In September 2024, USNS Supply received the Navy Unit Commendation for her support to the Ike Strike Group, a combat award usually reserved for frontline warships and units, not logistic ships. In early 2025, she also received Military Sea Lift Command's Maritime E recognition for operational excellence. Those awards are the Navy quietly admitting this ship performed beyond even high expectations. But here's the kicker. The dedicated TAOEX replacement program the next generation fast combat support ship was effectively killed off in the mid 2000s as a cost saving measure. The White House and Pentagon decided the Navy would keep the existing supply class in service longer and rely more heavily on T8 dry cargo ships and oilers instead. New programs like the next generation logistics ship TAOL and the John Lewis class oilers are coming online, but they're slower single product ships not like-for-like -like replacements for fast multi-product AOEs. In other words, Supply and Arctic just proved in combat how irreplaceable they are, and there's still no funded program to build their successors. So what does this mean for American sea power? Start with strategy. The entire idea of forward presence, keeping carrier strike groups on station in the Western Pacific, Mediterranean, and Middle East, depends on ships like Supply and Arctic. They're what let a carrier operate as if the ocean were a mobile base, rather than having to retreat to friendly ports for fuel and ammunition. Without them, carriers start to behave more like regional assets than global ones. Their operating patterns become more predictable. Their time on station shrinks. Now zoom out to the competition. China already has the largest navy in the world by ship count, with over 370 battle force ships today and Pentagon projections of roughly 395 to 435 ships by 2030, depending on the estimate. They're also fielding their own fast resupply ships, like the Type 901 Fast Combat Support Ship, specifically designed to keep carrier groups supplied at speed. But here's where the U.S. still has an edge. Experience. The U.S. Navy has been doing high-tempo underway replenishment since World War II. The techniques refined by today's combat logistics force safely moving fuel and ordnance between big ships day after day in all conditions are the product of decades of real deployments, not just exercises. Supplies 143 unreps in a combat zone are part of that deep well of expertise. That experience is hard to copy quickly, but there's an economic angle too. When Rainier and Bridge were pulled from service, the Navy cited high operating and fuel costs for gas turbine AOEs and projected operations and support savings on the order of tens of millions of dollars per year compared with cheaper oilers and cargo ships. On a PowerPoint slide, that sounds smart. In reality, replacing one AOE's capability often takes multiple ships, a TAO for fuel, a TA for cargo and ammo, sometimes additional support, each with its own crew, maintenance, and vulnerability. For sustained high-end operations like the Red Sea, the savings evaporate quickly in extra hulls, more man hours, and more complex scheduling. It's like getting rid of your one heavy-duty pickup to save fuel, then renting three separate vehicles every time you need to haul anything serious. Meanwhile, the calendar keeps moving. Supply was commissioned in 1994, Arctic in 1995. Navy planning documents have long assumed these ships would serve into roughly the mid-2030s. But as they cross the 30-year mark, the risk of major material casualties rises. 
and the Mariner pool to crew them is under strain. Right now, there is no fast combat support ship in the design or construction pipeline to take their place. So where does this leave America's naval future? Best case scenario, Congress and the Pentagon accept that logistics is deterrence and fund a modern fast combat support ship. Call it TAOEX 2.0. You take the lessons of supply in Arctic, add hybrid or more efficient propulsion to cut fuel burn updated unrep gear and automation to reduce crew workload, better survivability features against long-range missiles and submarines, a small class of four to six new AOEs paired with John Lewis-class oilers and future NGLS ships would give each deployed carrier strike group a truly high-end station ship with backup. More likely near-term scenario, the Navy muddles through, Arctic continues to shoulder Pacific and global tasking, supply cycles back into deployment after heavy maintenance. John Lewis-class oilers and Lewis and Clark-class cargo ships pick up more work, but they're slower and require more hulls to match what one AOE can do at speed. Meanwhile, military sealift command is sidelining some logistic ships and shuffling crews around just to keep the rest properly manned, trying to fix a mariner shortage that won't disappear overnight. Worst case scenario, a major crisis exposes the vulnerability in real time. Picture a Taiwan contingency in the late 2020s. China has grown its navy toward that 400-plus ship mark and built up anti-ship ballistic missile and submarine forces explicitly designed to target U.S. logistics. Carrier strike groups surge west of Guam. Operations are intense. Combat air patrols, strikes, missile defense, long transits. And in that environment, a single AOE, supply or Arctic, takes a hit or even just suffers a major mechanical failure. Suddenly, the strike group isn't worried about whether its fighters can reach the target. It's worried about whether there's enough fuel and ordnance to keep flying at all. Here's the uncomfortable truth. America's naval supremacy doesn't rest only on stealth fighters and hypersonic weapons. It rests on gray, unglamorous hulls like USNS Supply and USNS Arctic quietly pumping millions of gallons of fuel and tons of ordnance into the fleet. The Red Sea proved these ships are combat enablers, not rear area trucks. Supplies crew didn't just do logistics, they enabled every intercept, every strike, and every rescued mariner Eisenhower's group pulled off on that deployment. So the next time you see footage of a destroyer shooting down a missile or a carrier launching jets into the night, remember this, somewhere over the horizon, there's probably a tired AOE crew that made sure those magazines were full and those tanks weren't empty. Right now, that lifeline hangs on two aging ships. And unless the U.S. decides to invest in what actually keeps the fleet alive, that might be the real Achilles heel of American sea power. If you found this deep dive into America's naval logistics valuable, hit that like button and subscribe for more analysis of the capabilities that actually matter in modern warfare. Drop a comment below. Do you think Congress will fund replacements or are we headed for a logistics crisis? Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.